Okay, so I've got, uh, if I can make this work here, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. Being recorded, got it. Share screen. Select window or screen. Oh, good. It just has names here. It doesn't look like the Windows one does. Entire screen. Oh, we'll try that. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm watching my other. <laughs> it's weird how all the stuff is really slow and you can't tell what's going on. So anyway, uh, this one is, if we look here at, this is the uh, translator for the Teb Planner. Can I get my chat back? Ah, oh, this is so complicated. Huh. Of course, now my my stop sharing has gone away. This might have been a bad we, idea to try to do this. We still see your um command velocity to Ackerman drive dot pi screen. And I would like to, I wanted to put something in the chat, but now I can't get to my chat window and I don't have a stop share button at the top here like I would normally have. So now I'm confused. Press escape and see if you get a, out of a, some sort of full screen thing. Oh, here we go. Your, your screen sharing. Okay, let me pull up chat. <laughs> so we'll see what that does. Let me pull up the chat on my other computer. Okay, so apparently apparently that worked. So this is the uh, the web page for um, the 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 translator. This is buried in the tab planner under scripts, and it's just a standalone utility you can start up. And it will subscribe to command velocity and publish on Ackerman on Ackerman message. So if I close that down, so I go to this screen here. And well, the first thing I'll show is that I have to bring up a ROS core. And I come over here and I say, I'm going to echo the Ackerman command message. It says nobody's nobody's doing anything yet. So if I come over here and then publish a uh, Ackerman message. Last topic, Ackerman. So this is just a command line that will publish an Ackerman message with a steering angle of 0.25 and a steering or a speed of 0.5. So to execute that, this executes continuously. So then over here on the right, you can see these are the messages showed up. So it's, it's just showing that if I publish an Ackerman message, the Ross topic echo uh, does indeed show that over here on the right. So if I cancel that, and then cancel this because I'm going to kill the core. I'm going to come down here and kill that. So if I start up a launch file to start that translator, it comes up. And then down the bottom here, it says it's listening to command velocity. It's going to publish on Ackerman command, a frame ID of ODOM. And I'm not sure what that's doing. I need to look in that. And here's the wheelbase that I told it. That's the distance between my back axle and my front axle. So that's, that's running. So I'll come over here and say again, show me the uh, Ackerman messages. Now, if I come up here and publish a command velocity message, here, let me, let me do this. So this is a, a just publish a standard command velocity message, which would make your vehicle drive around. And it says a forward speed of 2.0 meters per second and a rotational velocity of 1.8 radians per second. So when I execute that, then over here on the right on the the Ackerman output, it says a speed of 2.0, which I told it, and then it converts the, the speed of 2.0, the, the radians per second value, and the wheelbase down here. It takes those three values and comes up with a number of 0.427 radians for the steering angle. So that, that mm -hmm. simply is, if you start this up, I could now take just the standard move base and the standard uh, local planner and it puts out command velocity, this will translate it into something that has a steering angle in it. 
So you'd have the option, you could make your vehicle respond to, to Ackerman command, and then no matter what you're running, uh, you can either run the translator to convert command velocity into that or generate command uh, Ackerman command messages directly. And I know that that software that, that Matt and Juan were running where it had the, uh, the pure pursuit planner or pure pursuit follower, that one would generate Ackerman messages. So you run across, you know, various things will publish one or the other, but having this translator, either run the translator or not, that should take care of, that way you can run. If your vehicle can understand the Ackerman command, then that would, that would let you run anything by either run the translator or not, because it, it will run directly. So I, I just wanted to show that I loaded that up and it does work. And let's see where I'm at here. Close all this crap down. And I think it was this one had. Um... Any questions on that before I move on here? No, that's a neat find. And that, that's been there the whole time. And as far as I know, most people have known about that. It's just that this is the first time I actually had a need to run it. Well, I should have organized this stuff a little better. Let me say history, wrap, ROS, launch. So I'm gonna have to do this about six times now. So I just wanna run this one. So 1839, so I say bang, 1839. And this will start at gazebo with my vehicle in it. And let's see, how do I do this? This, put this over here, shut this down, and I'll leave that open for a moment. So here's my vehicle, and it's got it's got the laser scanner on the front. If I zoom out, you can see it's 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 got a range of eight meters, is what I told it, because that's what the scanner does, and it's got a 180 degree scan. So in gazebo, you can say you want to visualize that or not. If I say don't visualize it, you wouldn't see that at all. So if I come up here and say insert and fire hydrants are fun. So I'll put a fire hydrant there and put one there. And if I say um, there's a dumpster, we'll have a real dumpster fire going here. So I can put the dumpster out there. So you can, the, way, the way this works, see it's got darker blue when it can see something. And then beyond there's a shadow on the, uh, beyond the laser scanner there. So if I now start this up, let's, uh, let's get rid of that and make this a little smaller. So now if I start up another window and let's say um, history, grep, or viz, and say bang, 1772. And now I've got the same problem that Al just had, nothing's showing up. Why didn't that work? That should have worked. Let me try again. Just, just for the heck of it, I'll try it a second time and see what it does. It's probably not going to work. And no, it doesn't work. Global status. Oh, let's change that. All right. I have to redo everything here. So I'll say uh, base footprint link, and then we'll say add robot model. Robot model, okay, bang. Oh, there, there. so there's my vehicle showing up there and uh, anything else fun? Oh, so if I say, put it like this, where we can see what's going on and zoom out and then say, add uh, laser scan. And say scan. And I like to make these bigger so you can see what's going on. So if you look at it here, ah, come on. Hey, what, what's annoying is between uh, gazebo and Arviz, your buttons work differently for scrolling and panning. So it's, 
So it's, 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 you have to be, be patient here. So here you can see the, the dumpster out here. And then here's a fire hydrant here and there's a fire hydrant there. And if we just look at the vehicle, you can see it's got the, uh, yeah. So this is what it looks at RVIS. And these, these red things are the steering joints and this big white thing, just my fake chassis I threw in there and the blue box is my laser scanner. And then the, uh, this up here is my GPS antenna. So we go back look at that on uh, gazebo. It's basically showing you the same thing. And here's the, the laser scanner putting out a scan beam. And as I say, you can turn that off if you want to. So here's the, uh, again, the, uh, the GPS antenna. Hey, that's not showing up, there it is. This is, has about a five second delay here, so it's confusing. It's got the GPS antenna just floating above everything. And then other things to note here, if I say start up some more, let's see, how do I get some more windows? Some more fun stuff going on here. Uh, at this point, that's a, that's still the Ackerman commands. I don't care about that at the moment. We'll say instead, I want to see, uh, uh, I, I, I could show you the ODOM, but I have to start up another program to do that. So I, I went through, there's a, a, a tutorial on construct that says, oh, suppose you want to get you want to get odometry information out of gazebo. Here are the steps. There's like a 20 minute video, and he took me through step by step. I had to watch the video and type it all in because he didn't point me to a link where it's all typed in. So I got it all typed in and ran it, and sure enough, it takes the uh, it takes your ground truth out of gazebo. So it says you are here pointed this direction. It just pulls that up and shoves those numbers into an odometry message and publishes that. So it's giving you perfect odometry as opposed to what I would want by watching my two back wheels and calculating odometry, because that'll give me all the error that you'd get with a real vehicle. But for right now, that should get me get me past that. Um, so other things I wanted to show was, well, scan, we could see the scan in, um, how do I get that back like that? Is 2D Navgo operational in our biz? Uh, it, it's operational, but I have no navigation running, so it's not going to, there, there, there's nothing to make it move right now. I either have to publish a Ackerman message to make it move, or I have to, uh, or I'd have to load up all the navigation stuff or load up a joystick to make it move. So, so no. So it is operational. It will publish a 2D nav goal, but it doesn't, nobody's listening to it. So what's the other thing I had was uh, GPS. Oh, oh, that's how it's called. GPS slash fix. So there is a fake GPS message that's being published. So here's my latitude and longitude. This is just a point in my front yard. Since I haven't moved, it's my reference point. So now if I pull up another window here and make it start moving. No, not that one, but this one. That's a blank screen, so it's so I will, I will get, issue a Ackerman command message and it will start moving. So I go down here, you'll see the vehicle is now driving around and I may or may not hit anything. No, it looks like I'm not going to hit anything. And if I pull up the, um, here's my GPS stuff running. And if I look at an RViz, it doesn't move an RViz simply because I don't have a uh, either a map or a or an ODOM specified at this point. So the robot, it's it's reference to uh, base footprint. So it's it's just the robot's not going to move. It just sits there looking stupid. But you can see the uh, you can see the laser scan is swinging around as it as it sees stuff. So now over here on Gazebo, you got to wait till it comes back around. So right about now, it should see. Well, up oh, there it is. So these should start, there it is, the, the fire hydrant showing up and there's a second fire hydrant. And now here's the dumpster showing up out there. So I, I've got those things working. I suppose the next thing would be to add the IMU to it. So it's got a fake IMU and I'm not sure what I'm gonna get out of that. But so that's what I've got working right now. You can see that, let's make it bigger there. So you can see it, it does indeed work and it's, I, I haven't verified that say the GPS is working correctly. Oh, I was, I was gonna show you that the, while it's running, the GPS is indeed changing. So if you, if you watch these numbers here, like, like these two digits right here, you'll see changing. 
And as it drives around, yeah, they do get bigger and smaller as it goes around the circle. So that, so the GPS is putting out something, but I haven't verified it's correct. And it also puts out the GPS, uh, what is it called? GPS slash fix slash velocity or whatever that's called. The, the other standard GPS message. It, it, so it's putting out standard messages, apparently. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I came up with here. So I've got, I've got the vehicle. I can drive the vehicle with Ackerman message. Uh, I've got the fake ODOM coming out that I, that I, I don't want to have turned on right now. I've got the laser scan. I've got the GPS. And then I, I need to add IMU. That'd be the other major thing that people use. And at, at that point, if it's, if it's all sticking together at that point, then I can start adding the navigation stop software on. And then I can do what Al wants by clicking a button, say, drive to our location and see what it does. And at that point, I've got the option of running move base with the standard planner, which push, puts out command velocity. I can run the translator to convert it into Ackerman message. That will make it run. Or I don't remember Teb Planner. I think Teb Planner will drop directly into the standard move base. So I can run the Teb Planner with one or two different output modes on that. Or everybody likes to run move base flex. I could load that up and either load the Teb Planner or not. So I got lots of options there. And by since that translator is available, any one of those options, I should be able to get it to work and make this thing drive around. That looks fantastic. I think I've forgotten, Jeff, how. So ODOM, mm -hmm. um, you do have an ODOM message or you don't have an ODOM message? I, I do have one now because I had to create it from, from Gazebo. So it's putting out an ODOM message. I just, I, I have to start up another program to make it do that. And I just don't, I, I, I hear I could probably do that. Control Alt T. And that's okay. You don't have to have to. I was just curious how. How do you get um, distance traveled information? I mean, it's it uh, it subscribes to a message in Gazebo called uh, Gazebo Model State. I think is what it's called, and in there it puts out. Um, let's see how quickly can I find that video. <laughs> Here and say um, simulation. Oh. This one. I take this, and now I got to figure out how to get back to chat again. This one. So there's the um, there's the link to this, and it's he goes through and he basically just uh, subscribes to a message, and he 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 takes it through step by step and explains it really well. He says, "Oh, we need this information." He says, "We we can get a service from Gazebo." So here, do, let's do a Ross service list, and it shows you all these different things going on. He says, "We want the one called uh, Gazebo." Um, gazebo model state and he finds that one and he says let's print out gazebo model state and then it's got a pose and a twist section so it tells you your xy offset uh, for your pose it tells you your xy offset and your heading and then under twist it tells you how fast how fast you know your forward velocity and your rotational velocity and things like that so it's got all the information and basically what he got done he just simply pulled up that message and was able to take those two sections and push them directly into a new odometry message. So he didn't even do any calculations or translate anything. It's the right data he needs. He just said, create a new odometry message and copy this section, copy this section and publish it. So if you watch that video, he'll go through and explain uh, how he gets that gets that stuff out of there. And what I, what I should do from us. What? Go ahead. No, what, what was your question? Well, I was just gonna, I was just trying to think through then to move from a simulated world to an actual world. I'm assuming then you would get, you would have to have then encoder. The expectation is you would have encoders on your wheels to get actual movement then, right? That 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 is true, but the but the 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 real statement is, it whether you have a real vehicle or a simulated vehicle, you have to have an odometry message. Now it's up to you how you create that odometry message, but that's just a standard thing that you have to have. 
So yes, on a real vehicle, if you want to create an odometry message, uh, I have encoders on my back wheels. I read that data up and um, I read it up and do a bunch of calculations to generate all that stuff. And I publish an odometry message. Now in Gazebo, they just simply created a fake one where they took the ground truth and, and built an odometry message. So either way, I've got a, a standard odometry message that's putting out. Cool. How do I you're sharing your screen now? How do I? Ah. What's this do? What's this do? Preview. No, how do I? <laughs> now I'm running Linux and I should have a stop stop sharing button up here, and I don't see a stop sharing. Uh, participants, da, 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 recording, chat, new share. How about if I do new share? Can I stop it that way? Uh, you actually have two screens going, so that might be part of the confusing issue. Uh, you mean two computers? I don't know how you've done it. You have two Zoom sessions going. Yeah, I got two two computers running, and I'm trying to do everything on the one computer, and it won't. So on Windows, up the top, it says stop sharing, but I don't see your browser is preventing access to your share screen. Great, great. So anyway, let's see if I can. Uh, here, I'll I'll just bail out of that one completely, and we'll see if I lose my audio and anything else here. So, so that's what I'll do. I I think that's all I had to show on that one. So I'll and just it seems Mod has raised his hand, by the way. It what? Uh, it appears Bob has raised his hand in Zoom. Okay, what do you got? What do you got, Bob? Um, just a, a question, a naive question, if you will. How close are you to being able to be interchangeable between, say, for example, you download um, readings and numbers, etc., from the robot into Gazebo? Would it transfer? directly or do you still have can you go back and forth um, between, between take, a, a physical vehicle and a simulation is your question right yep well as long as the messages are the same messages it doesn't know the difference so okay, what i good. what i have to do is either on the simulator either make those messages you know like like for instance right now it's for gps it's, it creates a topic called slash gps slash fix and on my robot, I've actually got a slash GPS zero slash fix, I think. So I, I have to make all the names match. And the reason why I've got a GPS zero on my real robot is because I have two GPS receivers on there. So on my simulator, what I need to do is copy that section uh, for the GPS, just copy it and paste it again, and then make one of them say GPS zero and one say GPS one. And then the, the message is the topic is that it creates because in there you define what it's going to be called. So I have to convert one to say GPS zero fix, convert there and say GPS one fix. But then that should, th then at that point, if I start up one or the other, you know, the rest of the software doesn't know the difference between those, that whether it's simulated or not. And like the odometry stuff, uh, as long as it's a standard odometry message, and I have to, I have to modify that program because I also want to publish the odometry transform which is something you could put into that same program. And you may or may not want that on all the time. So I should have a parameter that says, you want to publish a transform, yes or no. And if I say publish a transform, then it automatically publishes both the topic and the transform. And that for a simple system, that makes everything work. But if you move on to the more complex ones, like say running the EKF filter, you, you want to turn that transform off so you'd set the thing, say false, don't publish a transform, and then EKF builds the transform for you. So, so basically, yes, if all the num the names, the topics coming out all have the same name, you should be able to switch back and forth uh, directly. Now, there, there are other little things that you'll say, oh, well, this isn't going to work, so you have to, you know, make up something new, have to add something new to get it to work. But, but yes, once you get to that point, you could have one launch file that says start the real vehicle. Have another launch file says start the simulated vehicle and whichever one you start up, then your main software doesn't know whether it's talking to a real vehicle or a simulator. Oh, interesting. Um, that way you can play all winter, just having the uh, if, or, if you or when it's raining out. Yeah, 
if you could just um, identify all the GPS locations of obstacles with your main outside robot and then import it, then you can play all winter on, with sensors and all kinds of things. Yeah, what you can do in Gazebo, you can build a map of, or build a, they call it a world. So you could create a world. And I was thinking that if you go to a, say, a, go to Google Earth or Google Maps and take a satellite image of your, your area, and I haven't figured out how to scale that. There, there's got to be some way you can stretch that to get it right. So, and I think Al was, did, did you play with that where you, you put in a, like a satellite view into our, or into our viz? Did you get it to come out to the right size when you're doing that? Um, well, I don't think I'm an expert, but I, I was able to get a black and white image to come out, I think. Uh, okay, the, the point is, I, I, I was wondering if you got the scaling correct. So, you know, when you put it yes. down, is one meter equal one meter, you know, the, yes. on, the, on the map. So if you can get to that point, what you could do, you could go into gazebo and lay that down as the ground plane. So you've got a, an image of what you see from a satellite and then go into gazebo and, and grab, you can say insert and grab blocks and fire hydrants and dumpsters and you can plop them on top of the, the image. So it says, here it shows, here's a picture of your house. So you could go and you'd take blocks and build your house and stick on there. So the ground would be, would look like the ground from the satellite. And then you have blocks stuck here and there to, uh, to, to represent anything that's out in your yard. So if you've got a fence, you could put a, you know, put a, put a thing along the, to show the fence. So you can, you can build up the world of your actual environment. So you were saying, get all the GPS locations well. It, it's it's really the same thing. You're just building a world that looks like if you take your robot outside, you know, that's what it would see. And the, the other thing is, if you put a camera right. on the oh. simulator robot, as you drive around, you could now see your fire hydrants and your fences and your house and your dog and your car and all that kind of stuff. Oh, uh, interesting. So a lot of just a lot of playing that's around all... to, to get that stuff to work. Mm-hmm. And most of this I did last night. I, that, that thing about creating the ODOM, I watched the video sometime in the middle of the week and typed all that in and got that to work. And then last night, I just sat down and said, okay, let's, let's make it do something fun. And I started with the GPS stuff and, and got that to work. And then I added the, uh, the laser scanner and I got that to work. So, so basically, you know, if I just sit down and do it, it's not, it's not monumental, to, monumental to get this stuff to work. And when I had the gazebo screen up, you saw that I, I had the robot, you could see the laser scan, and I started dropping objects. I said, you know, grab a fire hydrant and put it here, grab a dumpster and put it here. They've, they've actually got some, you can go and say insert, it's like a, a gas station. And it's got, you know, it's got the, the convenience store and it's got the islands with the gas pumps and you just drop that down and that's all ready to go. And I think there's one called playground or something that possibly, you know, would it, it wouldn't match your particular property or your house but you can right. you, that's a, a ready-made thing you can put it down and drive around in it okay that sounds like fun so any, any more questions on that not for me no thanks okay so let me uh let's see jump to everyone got that i got that so let me let me say how do I do this now? If I say close that, close that. Let me try sharing screen again. Let me go to this screen. And uh, let me pull up. So I'll move on to uh, here's what I was complaining before about my. Oh, this, this is actually a movie. I don't know what that. This one. This one. This is. I just, I just took a picture of my robot outside. I showed this a long time ago. And here's my LED status strip at the bottom here. Here's the little Arduino Nano that drives it. And I pointed out that if when the, the camera can't see the colors for some reason, you, if you zoom in and you look real hard, the first four are green. Yep. This, this one is off. There's two blue ones. And here's a red one. And you, you can barely see those. And I couldn't figure out why. And then I found out if I run... Uh, whether, whether I do a movie or a still image. So here's a movie of the same thing. And uh, you'll see that this first one will turn off and the next one will turn yellow. Oh, I have to hit this button. 
So the, it had the four green ones. I put my hand over the, the GPS. So this one dropped out completely. And this one turned yellow. But see, they're, they're not saturated enough. If I make a movie and say, well, watch the status, you can't see that. So that was the whole point of you know, why I went down this path. I was trying to figure out why I can't do that. So then let's go back to the images. So in the house, it does this, where I've got three, three LEDs uh, here is, is, I think it's blue, green, and red. And then another blue, green, and red across here. And these are set to 50% intensity. And these are set to 100% intensity. I, I get to thinking that on the LEDs uh, strips, they, you can change the intensity. So it's probably P, doing a PWM on the LEDs. And I figured, well, my camera, it's a, some kind of a Nikon, you know, like a, like a fancy camera. It's not like a cell phone. And it could be that either the, the sensor on that is sensitive to different wavelengths and can't see the LEDs or the fact that the LEDs are blinking on and off. And if they're blinking on and off, then if the camera doesn't synchronize, they wouldn't be as bright. But now in the house where I don't have a lot of ambient light around, now that even the these three right here are equivalent to what I had last time and they're washing out everything. So the camera, see the camera's adjusting to the ambient light of the room and what it does, and the, the LEDs are so bright, it just washes everything out. So I set mm. the, the, the three on the right, I set to 100% intensity, thinking that would uh, make it brighter outdoors. So so again, if you zoom in on it, there, there's there's three here and three here. And you can barely make out what they're doing. They're all they're all uh, mushed together. And then I, if I move on to, back to my movies here, uh, what's the other one I want? 11.07 this one so this one um, is, is again in the house so there's something interesting here when it um i i think i don't remember just when i'm running the movie or when i'm doing a still shot but see the it's got these vertical lines here they're just artifacts of the the fact that the the leds are too bright and the camera creates these these vertical lines and they'll, they'll be more obvious in a second here but as it, as it runs you can watch those and then up at the top here there's a, a piece of aluminum and you can see a reflection of the LEDs. And there you can see the actual LEDs. You can see the, the, three, the three colors of each one. So I'll, I'll go ahead and run this through once. You can watch what it's doing. But if you watch these stripes down here. So right, right there, you can see that, see this one is, it, it's on and off and on and off with about a 50% duty cycle. And the three over here, it's on for about 95% of the time and off for just a short time. And the thing is, when you run this, you can see those actually moving on there. And that's just, just an artifact of the camera. Here's the thing at the top that I was talking about. Now, I'll run this through again and, and point out things. But, but it's just interesting that you can see the, see the fact that the LEDs are PWMing because you can see it based on those lines right there. Mm. So let me start yep. it again here. Yeah. And then, so so if you watch at the top here, I'll run it and stop it where that shows up. So right right there, you can see the reflection and there's a blue and a green and a red and a blue, a green and a red. You can see the three on the right are brighter than the ones here. So these are a 100% duty cycle and those are 50% duty cycle. But at least indoors, it does not solve my problem. So I need to take it outdoors and see if there is a difference between setting the PWM, if that makes a difference. And the only other thing I can point out is that, here, I'll just let this run through. The only other thing I can point out is that then I pulled out my cell phone. I've got a the Samsung cell phone that they forced me to buy. And I, I did a, a, both a, I've had a photograph and a movie with that. And it acts differently. It works better than my Nikon camera does so that that's kind of where I'm at with that. <clears throat> that, that that's um, my experiments I've done on that. How did, can you speculate on how those artifacts show up on your camera? Uh, have you seen the new pictures from the James Webb telescope with the big spike sticking off the stars? Yeah. I think it's similar to that. Just something about the optics and I, I don't know what causes that. <clears throat> okay. So it's, it's just interesting that that showed up. I didn't expect to see those and it does show up. So that's, that they're, they're just simply there. So let's see. Um, da, 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 da. So I think that's, that's basically what I had to say. Do you, let's, let's move on. Do you have uh, any, any thoughts or uh, stories or anything else? Well, I was thinking about your LED strip. If 
would visibility increase if you raise it up higher, like another two feet or something, and that way you get a, a direct look into the LED rather than a, a downward look? Would uh, you see more? No, because let me pull up my photos again. Make a screen share. Where'd my pictures go? Okay, assuming you can see that, I it the answer is no. When I when I was doing the movies in the house, let me go back to my movies here because oh, this okay. one this one is looking pretty much straight into it right there. Well, the, these oh. are these are driving it so hard it's 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 blowing out the image anyway. So it could be out outdoors. Oh. It would be, but if I stand outdoors and just look at it from any angle, just to the human eye, they they look great. You know, they're they're really bright and they seem to seem to work really well. It's just that the some reason the camera doesn't like it. And, oh. Okay. And even even outdoors, what's what's the other one here? Eleven seventy one. Because this is the one outdoors, and this this is fairly fairly straight on. I'm I'm down fairly low at this point. Yeah. And see that doesn't. Yeah. They just don't show up, and for some reason the the response of the camera and the response of the human eye are different. And okay. that's why I need to try with the the cell phone outside. If 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 it works okay with the cell phone, then I'll just go ahead and. Uh, make all my movies using my cell phone, so that will that will take care of that. Okay. And I, I tried putting a piece of paper over. Think the paper would diffuse it, and that would work better. It it does show up a little bit better on this camera, but um, it it also just blurs them out. It's just harder to see what's going on too if you do that. So that oh. that was that wasn't the answer. So I'm just still, still trying to figure out what to do about that, and that's just one of my latest experiments on that how about a shade um i i haven't tried that that's that's a good idea i can i can try that too and see what it does so that okay. that, that might work yeah i've got basically this i have a, a backup camera that i can put on my tractor and i did that a couple of times but like you pointed out once you get outside in the ambient light I had to almost make a tunnel of cardboard in order to look, be able to look into it. And it had to be almost at, at eye level. And um, once I start restricting my vision, then I get real uncomfortable operating a tractor. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you could come up with some kind of a head up display where you can tweak things, then that would be nice. But I don't have a million dollars to go that way. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean on that. <clears throat> so how's your how's your radio experiments coming? Um, they're going. I've got. I ran the example messages, and I can see the um, both the code and the resulting message in the in the shell script. So now, um, but I have to switch my monitor cable between each one. So I was figuring out how to do that. So I started using real VMC. So now I can see one radio on, the, on, my, uh, on this one on the iPad and I can do the HDMI into the other one. So now I got two screens and I can compare uh, what transmits and what receives and things like that. Then yesterday, um, I took my the the remote, which is the the Model B, and 2012 model, and with that funky wire antenna, I walked outside with my no, I took the iPad out, and I could keep a lock on that that uh, VNC server up to almost 100 yards. But beyond that, if I disconnect and try to reconnect, I couldn't make the connection. But that's with that funky antenna. Now, after that, I put the short coil antenna like you're supposed to, and I haven't tried that yet. But one thing I like about the messages with the radio is it'll give you a signal strength um reading on it 
So that'll be the next I'll experiment with. But now I'm trying to figure out, okay, now I've got my iPad that's got the, um, the viewer and I've got the two pies with servers and I wanna test them individually. But then I also figure I've got the household router to contend with. So how can I isolate them or position them outside so I know I can get true communication from say the, the laptop, laptop to my robot outside without going through the home router? Well, what you can do, you can set up what they call ad, an ad hoc network where you don't connect to the router at all. You just simply, your, your iPad would connect directly to the access point on your, on your vehicle. And it, it, it's just a, a, a two point connection then at that point. So you won't have any internet connection, but if that's what you want to do, that, that would let you walk, you know, you could go clear to the other end of your property and you're not required to be able to talk to your access point. So as long as you, with your, you're within distance of your vehicle to make a connection, that will work. Okay. And, then, and in, in the Linux side on the, uh, on your vehicle, on your Raspberry Pi, you just go under networking and it's, um, I can't remember what they call it, but it's, I think it's fairly obvious. They either call it point to point or they call it. Uh, yeah, point to point I've seen. It, but anyway, one of the options, because under the options it says you want to connect to an access point, you want to connect to something else. And it just says, it might say set up a private network or a point to point or something like that. Now on your iPad, I'm not sure I, I have no idea what the what the networking stuff and that looks like, but it should be smart enough if you've got to, to set up that kind of network. So that would let you just talk, you know, just between those two devices and won't be talking to anybody else in the world. I like the, the real VNC because it's simple and I can understand it pretty quick. Um, but then if I start trying to add another machine, like um, I have a, a Judson Nano, um, you can't put real VNC on that because something about two different architectures or cores or something, but they recommend go using a uh, remote desktop software called Remini or R-E-M-M-I-N-A, something like that. So, but that looks like an awfully steep learning curve for, for me. Um, so I think I'll just I'll just play around with uh, real VNC for a while, so I get used to that the VNC kind of learning curve, be able to send messages back and forth before I bite on anything more complicated. But with the VNC, I can uh, use the iPad, log into either Pies. I can start a program, I can make changes. Um, I can, um, I don't have any way of, of triggering the buttons. So that'll be another thing. Um, and the buttons right now, I wanna change the messages that are sent and received to be more realistic. Like, a, um, like the first button would be um, like, uh, send a question, the equivalent of, are you there? And it would come back or acknowledge. The second button, or I mean, the third button would be a pause where it would pause the robot or whatever momentarily. And then the middle button would be like a resume, just keep on going. So the, the first function is just a, a safety, shut it down or pause it. Um, so now I have to figure out how to input those messages into the radio from the outside. All the software so far is um, just static commands within that, within that loop. And I have to figure out how to import, like what you did with your joysticks, how you get that data into, to, uh, to transmit on the radio. So that, that's my net. Well, first is um, first thing is figure out how far I can stretch this thing physically. Then I'll look at the changing messaging kind of thing. 
Well, several points there. Probably you could probably get some version of VNC to run on a Jetson Nano. There's they, they have things called VNC Lite and all kinds of different options. Yeah. And if you just search and say Jetson Nano VNC and see what other people are doing, possibly you can get it to run on that if if you if that's what you want to run. Um, it, it, you may you just made the comment from your iPad. You can log into either of your Raspberry Pis and see them. Is have you tried? doing both at the same time. So start up yeah. two top copies of VNC on your iPad and then have both of them showing up. Um, I tried just one viewer looking at both servers and it, that won't work. It's only one server at a time and I have to log out of one before I can lo log into the other one. I've not tried two viewers on the iPad. I, I um, think that might work in that way. If you really want to see them both at the same time, that might actually work. I might it's, try that. It's yeah. going to be pushing a lot of network traffic if you do that, but that, that may work if that's, if you want to see them both at the same time, that'd be one way to do it. Yeah, I'll, I'll try that one. That, that's uh, worth an experiment anyway. Yeah, we have on our modem, we can, we can get uh, two channels, a 2.5 and a five gigahertz. And we're having some problems because we're at the end of the line. We have some interruption problems during uh, what we're trying to do. Now, when my wife is trying to do a virtual meeting, um, it'll cut out occasionally. So we have to make sure nothing else is using the internet. And, and then it, if she goes to 5G, it's more reliable, but we still have to interrupt. Um, so maybe the best thing to do is get off the router completely, like you say, with an ad hoc network and see what goes on. Another option, just get an old old router that nobody's using and set that up. So you got your own, if you want an access point in there, that, that way you can set up your own router to, uh, to, to talk to instead of connecting directly between the devices. Come to think of it, I've got a couple of wireless routers. I'll have to dig out and try that. So you don't even hook it up to the internet. You just uh, fire it up and and just go through that one. Yeah. In fact, when I when I used to do demos, like say take my stuff down to the hack factory where I'd have a, a base station computer and I'd have a computer on the robot, I'd just take an extra router and plug it in the wall and set it on a shelf somewhere. And then both both my devices would connect to that and that would keep everybody happy. Oh, okay. I'll have to dig that up. I have to try that one. And I'm not sure how much interference you get. Say if you've got two routers in your house, I don't know if they interfere with each other. You know, you might at least put one at one end of the house and one at the other, or like yeah. if you're going to be running outside, you know, it's put it outside somewhere um, that, that's going to be close to where you're, you're running your vehicles. So that, that might be another option. Say, for example, this is just brainstorming. I put a router on a solar charger so it, and a battery and put it out a reasonable distance from the house so that that wireless range could barely touch the range of my Wi-Fi connection on the, on the iPad. Does it work that way or is it just the one distance from your wireless? I, I, I don't um, know. Think of, think of two circles um, as the... Um, as the Wi-Fi connection. And if I brought those two circles closer together, the range of the Wi-Fi's so that they overlap, um, I should be able to talk to the router out in the field. Say for example, my iPad has a range, a Wi-Fi range of 300 feet. Okay, how about if I go out 400 feet and set up the router will the router be able to see the ipad well it's just it's just the distance between the two is what what makes the difference so if you get too far away no it's not going to work oh okay <clears throat> okay and you're just going to have to experiment experiment with it and see what it's going to do and you don't want a situation where if you get out of range all of a sudden everything quits on you you know, make sure make sure you if if you got it hooked up to your actual tractor that it loses connection, it will stop. <laughs> stop. 
Yep. So you don't want to have it where it loses connection. You go, oh, gee, what's going on? Your tractor's <laughs> taking off driving across the across the field. So, yeah. Well, I've got a, a 10 foot fence all around the property. So uh, worst comes to worst, it'll crash into that fence and hang up. <laughs> but well, I don't well, want to. Yeah. Will the fence stop your tractor? Tractors are pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting. But uh, any, anyway, that's about where I'm at right now. Okay. Is you, all your snow gone? I assume you're close enough to me. Yours should all be melted too. Is Al still there? No, he, he left. Oh, okay. Yeah, he left about uh, 10 minutes ago. Oh, okay. And then it looks like Ross left as well. Yeah. So, well, I guess I got my homework set up for me. Oh, the other thing I was going to ask you, okay, um, if I wanted to do this on my laptop and have two screens, one for each, um, I would call up a terminal for each one. What, what are you trying to do? Um, see both pies on a laptop what do you mean by see them you run vnc or run a terminal to each um one? i want to be able to see the desktop of each pie then i assume you're gonna to have to run two copies of vnc on your laptop and each one would connect to whatever the oh okay the, I, the ip address of the raspberry pi yeah you, you can try that and see if that works yeah well i've got the pie is set up with static um land and and wireless addresses so um there won't be any confusion there and they're they're the, the wi-fi and the, the ethernet are different ip addresses yeah okay yeah. okay so, so you're, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have a total of four ip addresses then because each raspberry pi has two ip addresses correct okay yeah, yeah. if i wanted to cable do some cabling and, and stuff but um I'm going to stick with the Wi-Fi addresses for now. That's I've set up the each server um, address as a Wi-Fi. So I'm gonna, I'll try that. Um, adding another another one, uh, another um, viewer, and see if I can run two viewers at the same time. That that'll be interesting. And at some point, it could be your computer isn't fast enough to do all this, so that that's another issue. It may may complain because of that. So, yeah, yeah, sounds good. And if if there's any question, again, get on Google and say you want to run two copies of VNC on a computer and see see what people say about it. And they may yeah say do it's this or don't do that. It's amazing what I can find on Google if I know the right words to ask. Yeah, that's that's the whole trick right there. You got to know you got to know what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, I think my next purchase is going to be some uh, proto boards, um, kind of like a hat for the Raspberry Pi, because um, the 40 pins aren't being all used by the radio. It's like 10, 10 pins are used by each radio. So that frees up some other. I'd like to push it as far as I can and see how much degradation happens if you know how far can you push a pie to to do things um i did order and i've gotten a um, teensy 3.2 and the 3.5 so after i get real comfortable with this learning curve on the on the raspberry pies then i'll switch i think i'll switch over to the the teensies because I really like that small form factor on the remote control. So, but that's a whole nother one learning curve at a time. So that's about all I got. Okay.